Hi, this is Father Bill W. here in Austin, Texas, and I want to welcome you back to uh, another of our podcasts. Uh, I am an Episcopal priest in long-term recovery, celebrated uh, 40, 48 years uh, back in December, and uh, did that through the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. If you haven't visited our website, I would really encourage you to do that. It's titled Two-Way Prayer. It's a new website and has lots and lots of information on the prayer practices that they used to do back in the early days of AA. I I found it a life changer for myself, stumbled on it about 28 years ago, I guess it was now, and really changed my life, pointed me in some wholly new directions and uh, getting a wonderful response from people all around the country and, and, and really around the world who are tapping into it and finding the power, the transformational power that this process has. A couple of uh, quick announcements. Um, if you have not attended one of our workshops, we have another one coming up. Uh, this one is on Saturday, August 28th from 10 to 1230. That is Central Time. Uh, and this is going to be hosted by Swanee Seminary. And uh, while the workshop is free, you do need to register. So if you would go to the Two Way Prayer website, and there you will find a link under events, check the calendar. It'll take you right to the registration form. Uh, If you're registering from Canada, they they may be having some problems. So um, uh, a couple of folks from Canada had called me that they're having difficulty registering for it. So um, you can can write me at twowayprayer at gmail.com and I'll help you with that process. And speaking of the joys of uh, modern technology, uh, uh, we're, we're having some difficulties with the workshop that's coming up uh, starting September 12th. And uh, this is on the 12 steps. And if you have uh, received a flyer for this already, please be advised that we're going to have to change the codes uh, on the Zoom link to that workshop. Uh, so, so be mindful of that. Uh, if you'll check back uh, maybe by w- later this week, we will certainly have the new codes and they will be clearly marked. So just go to the website uh, later in the week and uh, you don't have to register for that one, but you do have to have the right codes. So um, we're starting a new series and this we're, this one we're going to be exploring what is the relationship between addiction and the world of the divine with, with God uh, as, as we experience God. It's a heavy topic but it is one that is absolutely vital uh, for recovery from addiction, uh, particularly if you're coming through a 12-step process. It's important that you understand exactly what, what what this connection is really all about and why it is so vital. Um, A big book says, you know, we had to quit playing God. It didn't work. Um, and um, then it goes on to say that getting this relationship right is really going to be the key to our recovery. So that's the topic for this, this series. And um, it's a greater problem today, I think, than it was back in 1939 when the big book came out, because uh, our old ideas about God really no longer work for a whole bunch of people uh, who are coming into recovery and so this God idea, uh, it's in transition, uh, and, and that makes it particularly difficult, uh, less so back in 39, but much, much more so today. So how do we approach it? Um, and here again, I believe the history of Alcoholics Anonymous can play an important role in helping us understand this. So uh, I want to base this series on the correspondence between Bill Wilson, the co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, and the famous Swiss psychiatrist, uh, Carl Jung. And uh, in order to to do this, um, we're going to be using a book. The book is titled The War of the Gods in Addiction. And this book is based upon the correspondence between those two men, between Wilson and Jung. And it goes much deeper into explaining what is the relationship between addiction and the divine, uh, tries to bridge the gap, I think, uh, between AA, 
uh, and depth psychology, the depth psychology of Carl Jung. So uh, David Shane is the author. He's a Jungian analyst. You won't need to have the book for uh, to benefit from uh, this series, but it, it certainly would be helpful. So uh, let's start off uh, with the correspondence uh, from Bill's letter to Carl Jung. And next episode, we'll, we'll get Jung's response. But I think there's enough in this one to uh, really dig in. Uh, and um, I'll have a copy of the letter in the show notes so you can, you can uh, access that. It'll, it'll help you follow what I'm going to be talking about and reading here. Um, and again, I, I want in this episode not so much to stay focused on the history. I've, I've dealt with that before. Uh, but I want to begin focusing on what are the things in Wilson's letter and then in Jung's letter that can be helpful to us as we try to understand addiction and especially how God is involved in that recovery process. So um, Bill begins his letter uh, telling Jung about his relationship with a man by the name of Roland Hazard. And Roland was a patient of Jung's uh, for some period of time. Wilson says in his letter that he was a patient for one year, but some recent research disputes that, uh, that it, it could not have been for that long a period. But, you know, that's really not what's important here. I think what is important is what are the dynamics that are at work in Roland's relationship with Jung. And if we can understand some of these things, uh, about that relationship, we will better understand our uh, recovery process as well. So I'm going to read some quotes from the letter and then pause, comment on how these uh, can benefit us or at least open up areas for us to be looking into. So uh, uh, pull some pull some quotes out of the uh, the letter and and. Um, Here's what Wilson says, uh, Roland, having exhausted other means of recovery from his alcoholism, he became your patient. And take away from that, that is getting to the program, get it, getting ourselves into recovery often takes a series of unsuccessful attempts. Um, and that's what Roland had. He attempted recovery and, and it did not work. And, and that is uh, one of the, one of the uh, hallmarks of, of the trail of destruction that, that we often leave behind us as, as we uh, begin going down that road towards recovery. It, it's going to be based upon failure. Uh, in, uh, in our lives in, in a number of other attempts. But he hooks up with Jung for however long it was. And then Wilson makes this comment. His admiration for you was boundless. So he had a really positive experience uh, in the therapy that he did with Jung. He, and he put great hope into that man. Um, and I think this is, this is kind of something that oftentimes we do with our sponsors. Uh, they're, they're almost godlike to us, uh, fountains of wisdom, you know, uh, uh, don't drink, <laughs> uh, go to meetings. Uh, I mean, it's a basic, basic stuff that they're saying, but it's like they descended from Mount Olympus in, in the saying of it. And if we have a good sponsor, uh, just like you have a good therapist, there's going to be this uh, thing that they call transference. And, and what transference is about is, is, is putting on to the therapist or putting on to the sponsor or putting on to some individual capabilities really beyond what that individual has. And it's a necessary part of the process. It's a necessary part of how we 
begin. Because if we don't make that initial transference, and it's a parental kind of thing, it's like they become mommy or daddy to us, you know, until what? Until we can become mommy and daddy to ourselves. But but uh, it has to it has to happen. So his admiration for Jung was boundless. But then what happened? Well, he relapses. Uh, and returning to Jung, they have a conversation that Wilson says becomes the real groundwork for our understanding of recovery. Um, and, and he describes that in his letter. And here's the quote. First of all, you, Jung, told him of his hopelessness so far as any further uh, so far as any further medical or psychiatric treatment might be concerned. I had a therapist who, who said to me, Bill, you are clinically hopeless. And, and I think he was following in this tradition to create in the client, to create in the patient, to create in the newcomer um, an awareness of the depth of hopelessness. So um, I really encourage people to uh, go back to your big book and, and other AA literature from, from the beginning times and, and, and look at how many times that word hopeless comes up. Uh, just, just jotted down a few here uh, from Bill's story. The remorse, horror, and hopelessness of the next morning are unforgettable. Certainly I was interested. I had to be, for I was hopeless. While I lay in the hospital, the thought came, there were thousands of hopeless alcoholics who might be glad to have what had been freely given to me. We of Alcoholics Anonymous know thousands of men and women who were once just as hopeless as Bill. Chapter two, we have recovered from a hopeless condition of mind and body. Uh, we have come to believe in the hopelessness and futility of life as we had been living. It goes on and on, you know? But the, I mean, to me, the message of step one, the word is not used there, but it's critical. It's hopeless. That's, you know, if, if you are powerless, that, that when you drink, the chain reaction starts and, and, and we don't stop drinking. And then when we try to stop drinking, uh, the mind kicks in and sends me back to doing the very thing that I, I want to not do. Uh, and that's a hopeless situation. That's a hopeless situation. So uh, um, I, I think I think our recovery is built on on that element of hopelessness. So if you felt hopeless, congratulations, you're you're, you're halfway there. You know, you paid the price. Uh, and then here's another line that's important coming from you. This is Wilson speaking. Coming from Jung, uh, one he so trusted and admired. The impact upon him, Roland, was immense. Something is needed to break through the, the, uh, to a, a, a hitting of bottom that is going to be critical to our, our recovery. Coming from, from uh, the man he so trusted, the one in whom he had put all of his last bits of hope withdrew them because um, he, he refused to see him as, uh, as, a, as a patient. He said, you, you, Roland, you are clinically hopeless. Uh, what's the old Chinese expression? You know, a crisis. It's also an opportunity. Uh, my hopelessness came to me when I was thinking of running. I, I was a great runner. I, I'd really go literally all around the world. And I was either going to escape to Australia or India. You know, it was one more geographical cure. And then I heard God's voice in my head saying, Bill, if those are your choices, there's something wrong with you. And, and I tell you, I genuinely felt that hopelessness, did not know where to turn. Uh, the only place I could turn to was uh, to a group of people I'd been in AA before, go back to them and, and say, 
I really need help this time. Uh, and they knew I was changed. Uh, when he then asked you if there was any other hope, you told him that there was, provided uh, uh, he could become the subject uh, of, of a spiritual or religious experience, in short, a genuine conversion. So what did Jung do? He pointed Roland towards the source of help. Your help is going to come through a reconnection or a different connection with the divine. That's the only thing that's going to have enough power to break through the strength of this hold that addiction has on you. We must find a power greater than ourselves. We must find access to that power. You know, I think of it as, as electricity or as juice or as, as something that has to pour in to our unconscious minds and motivate and sustain and guide and direct us. We call it God. We call it higher power. Call it spirit. Call it whatever you like. But for God's sakes, call on it. <laughs> That's, that is the key. And, and, and Jung said to him that if you would, this is a quote, place himself in a religious environment and hope for the best. So that's exactly what Roland does. He, uh, he returns to New York City, becomes involved with the Oxford group. And, uh, and here in the letter, Wilson notes the, the focus of the Oxford group. He speaks about its emphasis on self-survey, uh, step four, confession, <coughs> what becomes step five, restitution, eight and nine, giving oneself in service, uh, step 12, meditation and prayer, <coughs> excuse me, step 11. So this is the core, the core of our steps. He, 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 Roland gets involved with the Oxford group. He gets uh, very much involved with Sam Shoemaker, who was the head of the Oxford group in the United States, living in New York City. And uh, if, you, if you're in New York City, as I was a while back, uh, I stop into Calvary Church. And in the back of that church is a stained glass window donated by Roland Hazard, uh, by the Hazard family. And uh, so it's a little chill that uh, that's where it happened. That, that, that Roland, through Jung, uh, goes in search of a spiritual experience, finds it through the Oxford group, and begins uh, his recovery. Part of his recovery was helping other alcoholics and uh, people who were like him. How natural that is, that that's exactly what, what we would do. They were, they were to help people. That was part of the Oxford group program. Go help others. Go bring about a change in others. Well, the change that we know best is somebody who's stuck in addiction and can't get out. So how do we bring hope to those who are experiencing hopelessness? Um, and this is the exact message that uh, Ebby carries because Roland works with Ebby, uh, gets him on the road to recovery. And then Ebby makes his famous call on Bill Wilson. And the most beautiful description of, of that, I'm, I'm so sad that it didn't make it into the big book, but it was uh, where Wilson describes it as if he had been chained to the back wall of a cave. And this is the way he's describing his addiction. He's chained to the back wall, can't break free sees his wife, sees his friends at the mouth of the cave, sees Dr. Silkworth at the mouth of the cave, saying, come out. And, and, and he can't break free. I hope you can relate to that, because that's really where, where you're getting down to the depths. You know, uh, Jung, said, Jung said something if you have trouble finding God, you probably haven't looked low enough. I love that phrase. But when you get low enough, then there's no place else to turn to. And so there he is, chained, 
and and in his mind's eye when 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 Ebby makes his visit, he said it was as if Ebby had broken free from his cave right next door and had now walked into Bill's cave and was extending his hand to him. And he, and he alone, was able to lead him out. Can't lead us out if we don't think you've been there yourself. You know, if you haven't been to the bottom, I don't know that you have any idea what it is like to be me. But if you have been to the bottom, and, uh, and maybe even to a bottom deeper than my own, then you have earned a special place of trust in my life. How did you do it? How the hell did you do this thing? And that's the attitude that we, we really need to bring to this process. Uh, so hope for the hopeless. And that, that's exactly the way Wilson described it, that Ebby came to see him carrying hope in one hand and hopelessness in the other. Boom, 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 boom. The message back and forth. You're hopeless. There's hope. There's hope for the hopeless. You know? And um, and, and this is the clash of opposites. That if you really start studying Jungian psychology, uh, it's it's premised on this, that, that there comes into our lives this clash of opposites. And the only thing that can come from this clash, don't, don't repress one over the other, allow them to clash. But what they will result in is a higher form of consciousness that is able to sustain both of them simultaneously. You see, we are hopeless. We are filled with hope. It's the same person we're talking about. It's you and it's me. We're, we, we know at our core of the hopelessness of our condition. And we know also at our core that we have found access to a source of hope. So now Bill tells Jung in his letter some of his own stories, how he sees the similarities, that Bill had also run the course of many treatment failures, how he had put his hope into Dr. Silkworth, the transference had happened. But after four attempts at treatment, Silkworth declares him hopeless. And, and he, says, he says to Lois, you better start preparing for Bill. You may have to separate from him. You may have to put him in an institution. Uh, he, he paints the picture for her, and, and, and Bill hears it. And it devastates him. It absolutely devastates him. But <laughs> in our crazy spirituality, there's nothing like a good piece of devastation to break through the denial and to open up a door that we did not even know was there. Quote, just as Roland uh, had been made ready for his conversion experience, by you, so had my wonderful friend, Dr. Silkworth, prepared me. <sighs> he gets terribly depressed in the, in the hospital room. He has his famous white light experience, and we, we've talked about that before. I won't repeat it, but Bill calls out from the depths, Oh, God, if there is a God, Not knowing, not believing, but knowing there was no other place to turn. Oh, God, if there is a God. Uh, and, and boom, comes the white light. Um, boom, comes the psychic change, the conversion experience. Uh, 
an experience of the presence of God in that room, a breakthrough, a breakdown of his ego, no longer able to sustain him. Uh, he, He knows that. He knows that at the deepest level of self, See, and that's where that's where this change is going to happen. You know, Jung Jung calls his name for God, in effect, is self with a capital S. It's like there's little self and there's great big self. And the little self with whom I had identified totally called my ego uh, is now taken to a new level of consciousness. And and and. And it's what Wilson describes as a mountaintop experience. Uh, And a wind, not of air, but of spirit, is blowing all around me. Uh, He has an encounter with the divine. And and these are more frequent than we think. Uh, They are more frequent than than oftentimes we, we think. Uh, but there are moments of breakthrough, moments of transformation. He didn't know who or what that was, but he knew it wasn't him. When I heard that voice that said to me, Bill, you are 27 if those are your two choices, going either to India or to Australia, there's something wrong with you. I didn't know who that was, but I knew this. That wasn't the me that had been thinking all the time before. It was a a new me, a deeper part of me, a part of me that I really wasn't very connected with. And it it wasn't really until I started to understand two-way prayer that uh, I made conscious contact uh, with this power and began to... uh, communicate with this power and allow this power to speak to me. Uh, And that, that was the source of the transformational process uh, for, for Roland, for Bill, and for so many uh, who, who have made our way into recovery, that we are in touch with something beyond the little self. Don't know how to name it. Don't know what to call it. That journey continues. And, uh, and that's where we're going to pick up uh, next time as we, we try to look in, in hopefully some greater depth at uh, what Jung uh, says in his letter back to Bill, because he answers it very quickly. And, and, and he's almost on his deathbed when he does it. So it's really, really important information. So we'll pick up on that next time, uh, kind of get into that in some depth, and then we will uh, begin looking at at the book War of the Gods and Addiction and look at some of the deeper parts of this transformational process from a Jungian perspective. And I believe that's a deeply, deeply spiritual uh, uh, perspective as well. So um, I hope uh, some of this information has been helpful to you. If it has, encourage you to uh, pass it on to a friend, uh, encourage them to access the the podcast and uh, go to the website and maybe even make it to uh, one of the workshops coming up. So um, till next time, uh, God bless and do keep coming back.